Good morning. Welcome to worship service at Forks. Once again, we're in our informal mode, uh, and we want to thank you all for tuning in last week and uh, picking us up online. Once again, this uh, will be available to you this week. Uh, a couple of announcements. First of all, if you have any prayer requests, please email them into the office, and we will make sure that we pray for you uh, during our prayer time in the worship service. Uh, also, Matt Reeser will be teaching his Sunday school class on the Shorter Catechism, but it will be an online class. And so if you're interested in being a part of that, please uh, look for your email and uh, follow the instructions on the email to be uh, a participant in that class. Once again, Matt Reeser is going to continue his Shorter Catechism Sunday School class at the regular Sunday hour at 9 a.m. And so uh, if there are no other things that uh, are being announced this morning and there aren't, uh, let's go ahead and do the call to worship. And the call to worship this morning is taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, vanity of vanities, and all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, and the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south, and goes around to the north, around and around goes the wind and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear with hearing. What has been is what will be. What has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new? It has been already. In the ages before us, there is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Let's come and worship the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we ask that you would receive our worship and although we are not close together in fellowship, we are united spiritually in fellowship by your word and by your spirit. So hear what we do, Father, and accept it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to ask all of us to uh, participate together as I ask you to recite the Apostles' Creed. And so I ask you, Christian, what do you believe? And I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We're going to take a few minutes now and transition into the pastoral prayer, uh, reminding each of us that since there is so much going on in our world, uh, this is an excellent time for extra prayer, not only for the church, but for each of our families, but also for our country and for our world. So pray with me. Father God, we come before you again this week in a very foreign atmosphere. We confess that we are not comfortable worshiping without our brothers and sisters in Christ around us. And we ask, Lord, that you would keep us one with each other united uh, as we undergo this change in our circumstances. But Father, even though our circumstances change, 
you do not change. The scripture says you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so until we can meet again, we ask, Lord, that you would continue to be with us, that you would bless us, that you would keep us safe, and keep our community safe, and those around us. And Father, we do pray for the country, that you would give us a, an ability to quickly get a handle on this coronavirus so that we might begin to stop it in its tracks, that we might be able to heal again. But once again, Father, we're reminded of your words in Second Chronicles, that if your people who are called by your name will stop their wicked and evil ways and turn to you and cry out, then you will hear them from heaven. And so, Father, we want to be the beginning of the healing of this land. So let our lives be that which please you. Teach us as we just wait to see what's to come, to know that we are those who have hope. And our hope is not in medicine, and our hope is not in a quick find to the, uh, to the illness's end. Our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ who made heaven and earth. And so, Father, when we have the desire to fear or to wonder where all of this is headed, help us to remember that you know every inch of the way and that you will take us there and you will guide us through it. For you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning's scripture is taken from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. I want you to hear the words of the Lord. They're inerrant, infallible, and inspired. Philippians 2, 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. As we take a look at these words this morning, I want to remind you of a couple of things. And first of all, it's that the world has never ever truly been safe place. The world has always gone through trials and tribulations and difficulties. As a matter of fact, back in the, uh, 1948 or 49, C.S. Lewis wrote an essay talking about how to live in an atomic age. And in that essay, Lewis said that the people were afraid because of the destructive capability of the atomic bomb. And they were wondering day by day if they were going to be destroyed by these bomb blasts. And he said, that is not the only time in history where the world has been afraid. And he gave some examples of places and times where that would have been. He said, for instance, it would not have been a very safe place to live with the Vikings coming over uh, and raiding your village in the middle of the night. Or it would not have been a very safe place to live uh, under Mount Vesuvius. Or it would not have been a very safe place to live during the time of the plague in Europe. And so the reality is the fact that we face another pandemic, and this is not the first, but the fact that we face this pandemic with the coronavirus is just an example of the effect of sin on the world. We have always had pandemics in one form or another. We just have not had the communication to relay that information so quickly. And so the reality is, because we are inundated with the information, we have to be careful not to become depressed or anxious about anything, 
And Jesus says not to be anxious about anything because he has everything under control. He says, fear not, for I am with you, even to the end of the age. And so this morning I want to share with you this passage from Philippians in which there are three things I want us to understand. And the first one is, that we should have the mind of Christ, that our attitude should be that of Christ. And this is often, you know, in theological terms, called the kenosis passage. Kenosis is a Greek word meaning emptying. And so, in the essence, Jesus is emptying himself of his divinity. Now, he's not really not taking away his Godhead, but he is setting aside his godly characteristics as Jesus of Nazareth, because if Jesus of Nazareth is fully human, and yet Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. But in this passage, we're talking about Jesus humbling himself, and there are two stages of Jesus' ministry. Uh, theologians talk about his stage of humiliation and his stage of exaltation. Humiliation was at the moment he became the child in the womb of his mother, and that lasted all the way through to his burial. So in essence, his humiliation was his entire human life. And he became exalted at his resurrection and continues to be exalted for the rest of eternity. And so he never became less than God and never became less than fully man. But in this passage, it tells us that Jesus humbled himself to the point where he didn't feel it was necessary to maintain his equality with God. He was willing to transcend that and become a human being, fully tempted as we are in all things, therefore being the perfect person to become our sacrifice. And so Jesus chose a lowly state to be born in a stable in Bethlehem. Now, it's interesting, <clears throat> he was God. He could have chosen to be born in the king's palace. He could have been born in riches, but he chose the lowly state of man. In matter of fact, Romans 12, 3 says this, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you to treat others with respect and love in all conditions is what we are required to do. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord, always being prepared to give an account of the hope that is within you, but do this with gentleness and respect. We are told we are to love one another. We are to see others through the eyes of Christ. We are to see our attitude reflect Christ's attitude. Once again, a quote from Romans. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So our attitude the scripture says, is to be like that of Christ. Our attitude is to love those less lovely to us. Our attitude is to love those who sometimes irritate us. Because after all, we could not have been more of an irritation to God as sinners than we have been. And incidentally, as my attitude becomes more and more like Christ's attitude, my life as a servant becomes obvious to those around me and to myself. So the first way we become obedient to God and to live the life he has called us to live is by having the attitude of Christ. My second point then is as we develop the attitude of Christ, we develop the nature as the servant. Jesus himself said he came not to be served, but to serve. As a matter of fact, a perfect example of that is on Passover evening when he got up and he washed the feet of the apostles. That should have been, somebody else should have been washing his feet. And yet here the God of the universe, now fully man, is washing the feet of these servants. 
And so Christ took on the role of a servant. And he left behind the glory that he had in heaven to become a servant of mankind. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on the cross. And so true servanthood is being, being willing to lay down your life, to die for someone else, even though that someone else may not be the perfect person in your mind. Because after all, we were not the perfect people when Christ went to the cross for us. That kind of love that the servanthood is called for is agape love. And agape is a Greek word meaning sacrificial. It's the kind of love that says, regardless of who you are or who I think you are or what you're like, I am willing to lay down my life for you. It's the kind of love that Jesus and the Father revealed to us in John 3.16 when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believed in him will have everlasting life. Agape love doesn't mean that you even have to like the person, but that you care for him as a creature of God. For example, in Romans 5, 8, we're here. God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, we were enemies of God. And we were not likely those people he would have chosen to be at a party because of our righteousness. But because of his love, he called us his people, and he died on the cross for us. Now, I know we face this coronavirus. You can't turn your television on or the radio on or anything else. But the reality is, as overwhelming as this virus seems to be, we have an opportunity to minister the love of Christ to others, to continue to minister it in our church, in our communities, wherever we come in contact with people. It's the love of Christ that turns things around during difficult times of turmoil and tribulation. It's Jesus himself who gives us the ability to do these things through his spirit. I want you to continue in your support of the community, certainly of the church, and of one another. Call on one another. Make a phone call. Write an email. Give them some sort of a, an acknowledgement. Let them know you're thinking about them and caring about them. If you have any needs, please call the church, call my cell phone, uh, send an email, do whatever you need to do. We'll get through this, and the exciting part is that when we come out on the other side, we'll be a stronger church for it, and we'll be more blessed by our faithfulness. As a matter of fact, Jesus talks about these things in Matthew 25, and he says, talking about, when, when, Lord, did we serve you? And he says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? And the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whenever you did one of these least things, for least of my brothers, you did it for me. There is nothing that we will do that the smallest task that won't reflect Christ's love to one another. And finally, my third point is when we have the attitude of Christ and we have the nature of Christ as a servant, then we will live a life of obedience in conjunction with those two things. My attitude reflects my nature and my nature teaches me to grow and be more transformed into a life of obedience. The New Oxford American Dictionary says that obedience is submission to another's authority. That's probably one of the hardest things for us to do, isn't it? Because we know we are right. We don't like submitting to one another. That's the worst thing in our vocabulary, is to hear us say submit. There have been more misinterpretations of the Ephesians passage of wives submit to your husband than probably any other passage of the scripture. And it totally misrepresents God's desire for us and his heart for us. When we submit to good things, we are not only being blessed, but we are bringing honor and glory to God. And so our life of obedience is a life of submission, one to another and primarily to God. And so we need to live that way. 
Interestingly enough, everybody, believers and non-believers, are required to be submissive to the will of God. And even though they don't, or they do, the reality of the scripture is all are required to become obedient and submissive to God's will. And then finally, the question becomes, why do I obey? And we become obedient, not for salvation, because our salvation is assured by the blood of Christ on the cross. We become obedient because, number one, it is God's will for us. We become obedient because in being obedient, we live a holy life. And God tells us to be holy because he, our God, is a holy God. But being obedient and being holy do not guarantee for us a life without tribulation or a life without illness or a life without disease. I had a professor in seminary, Dr. Steve Brown, who once said he believes that when a non-Christian gets cancer, a Christian gets cancer so that the people can see the difference between the difference of one having hope and the other having no hope. Now, theology of that stinks, but the reality is we do act and react differently during times of trials and tribulations because of the hope we have in Jesus Christ. And so finally, I want to read this to you in Leviticus 11.44. I am the Lord your God. Concentrate yourselves to me and be holy because I, your God, am a holy God. I think that over the next few months, and I do think this is going to be longer than just a few more weeks, I think over the next few months, we'll have opportunities individually and as a church to show the love of Christ to the community, to those around us, and even to places where we work, even though we're not in contact with them right now. There will be a time when we will be returning to work and how we've weathered the storm and how we've acted and reacted will make a difference. I do not think this world will ever be the same as it was before coronavirus, but I do know this, that my God will be the same. For Hebrews tells us that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Pray with me. Thank you, Father, for the encouragement of your word. Thank you for the opportunity to to share your love with those less lovely. Thank you, Father, to be a part of a church and to be able to lift up one another during this time of crisis. And our prayer, Father, is not that you take us out of this, but you take us through this stronger, more willing to die to self and to live for others. For we ask these things in the name of the Father and of the Son, out of the Holy Spirit. Amen.